Is it, Brian? So anyway, so thank you. This is the inaugural backyard theology that we've got. So we are called. God reveals himself in many ways, doesn't he? Sometimes that call is loud and jarring. So much so that it, it practically knocks us off our feet. Think the conversion of St. Paul on the way to Damascus. Other times, it's quiet and more subtle. So much so that we are unsure of really what we're hearing. Think young Samuel, who mistook God's voice on more than one occasion for his master's calling. Sometimes we need to discern what, it, what, what we're being told. Sometimes we listen. Oftentimes we don't. But fortunately for us, for the next four Fridays, including this, we're going to have several speakers that are going to come. And fortunately for us, they not only heard their call, but they lived it. And so it is my pleasure tonight to introduce Father Mike Rizzo. He's a parochial vicar at St. Simon and Jude. But prior to that, he was one of us. He was a parishioner here at St. Elizabeth Ann Seton and a Knight of Columbus. So his calling came a little bit later, but, and we'll let him, him talk. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, his calling was, was you know, to become a, a recovered lawyer, a recovered lawyer. Um, and so he, he's going to talk. He's going to talk for a while. We will have some time for some, some questions and answers at the end. And so sit back, enjoy, and, and let's, let's all be inspired by Father Mike. So Father Mike, right, thank you. welcome. I think these are about the same, right? Yeah, that's probably good. All right. Put this over here and figure it out here. All right. Is that going to be loud enough? No one's ever told me they can't hear me, but I want to make sure. Well, it is always good for me to be back here. Uh, in 2011, my wife and I got an apartment right up the street, up the hill, in Turtle Rock up there. Um, and it was just, uh, it was just gorgeous to be up there. And we came here at Mass. Uh, she came really only a couple of times that fall because then she died um, in February of 2012. So from then on, I was coming by myself, uh, wondering what I was going to do next. I was working at a company in Irvine, uh, just off Sand Canyon, a mathematics company. And I needed to really consider where I was headed with my life since my original retirement plan was not going to pan out the way I had hoped it would. So apparently God had a different plan, but at that stage in my life, I didn't know uh, what that was, and I certainly wasn't hearing God's call at that moment. Um, but let's go back a little bit and just think about God calling and the stages at which he calls us, the stages at which he called me, how my life changed over the years, and how I was in a position from time to time to answer a call. Sometimes it was God's call, and um, I maybe did ignore it. But I was born, many of you know, in New York, and so uh, growing up, I went to Catholic, high, uh, Catholic elementary school, and I went to a Jesuit high school in Manhattan, which was a fine place and uh, really gave me some fine, firm footing in my faith. Um, then off to college and law school where I met my wife and we came back to New York and I worked in a law firm there and I had always wanted to be a lawyer. People ask me now, well, did you want to be a priest when you were young? Like, no. It never, ever occurred to me. I think it's possible that if a priest who I was close to had asked me, you know, I would met many priests in high school. And if any one of them had actually seriously had a conversation with me about being a priest, it's possible that I might have at least listened. 
but my heart was set on being a lawyer from the time I was in the fifth grade. So um, that's where I was headed uh, through high school. If anybody asked me through college, if anybody asked me, certainly once I was in law school, I was on the trajectory to do exactly what I had hoped to do. And 30 years of being a lawyer was a great career. From 1984 when I graduated law school until I retired, I guess, officially from what was then McGraw-Hill Education, which we had sold our business to, um, I, was, I was very blessed in my career. Having met my wife, we got married. I moved her to New York, so she became an honorary New Yorker. She became an honorary Italian and an honorary New Yorker. Uh, two very esteemed titles, actually. If any of you have the opportunity to become either one of those things, you should definitely do it. Um, so we moved back there. Uh, then we moved to New Jersey. Our son was born just before we left New Jersey for uh, a little town called Lake Oswego, Oregon, which is right by Portland. Uh, where the new owners of our finance company uh, were headquartered and they moved us there. So there we were for the next, really until my wife passed away in 2012, so that was almost 20 years for her and slightly longer than that for me until I was uh, sitting there. You hear your wife's small, still voice from the other room. Sometimes it's not so still or small. <laughs> You need to do blah, whatever, whatever, whatever. And you're just like, it's like Charlie Brown. And they wah, 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 wah. And then you stay sitting there. And about a half hour later, your wife now walks out to see you there and says, did you do what I asked you to do? And you're like, well, what? Well, what I just, I asked you a half hour ago, did you, are we done? Are we ready to go? Like, where are we going? What are you talking about? I have no idea what's going on here. Her voice was drowned out by your own thoughts. Her voice was drowned out by whatever you were focusing on other than listening to her. <coughs> I'm, I was particularly good at that in my 27 years of being married. I could drown my wife out very quickly. My father used to joke that he was hoping to get hearing aids at some point so he could turn them off and not hear my mother. That was... <laughs> um, the point is, we have to be open to not only the earthly calls of those who are near and dear to us, but to the heavenly call of our Heavenly Father. And it will appear to us in a variety of ways, and they may not be dramatic or amazing, but they will always be fruitful. They will always be rewarding. They will always be beneficial. God will never give us a call that is harmful to us. There's a whole process of discerning spirits uh, in the Jesuit, in Jesuit theology. And to discern spirits, you have to consider what the spirit is trying to tell you. What is that voice? What is that voice bringing you toward? What is that voice keeping you away from? And God's voice brings you toward things, opportunities, people that are good for you. You may not recognize that they're good for you, but they're, he's bringing you toward something, a place, a person, a possibility that is beneficial. And oftentimes will tell you, keep you from those situations that are not. And when you hear that, when you're considering those things, you need to say, here I am, Lord. You can't harden your hearts, because if you harden your hearts, you will lose the opportunity to gain that wisdom. There's a whole book in the Old Testament of the book of wisdom. Wisdom gives us all of these sayings, all of these beautiful phrases, all of these amazing descriptions of wisdom, how wisdom lives in our lives. Wisdom is the voice of God. Wisdom is that small, still voice. Wisdom is that conscience that God creates within us. Many people think that when they're old, they automatically get wisdom. That's not true. I can tell you that, you know, in 62 years, I didn't automatically get wisdom. 
I don't know if I'm 90, I might know my father. He's got some wisdom, he's 90. But he didn't automatically get wisdom. It doesn't just come with age. You don't just click up another notch on wisdom just because you had a birthday. Wisdom comes from experience. Wisdom comes from compassion and love and relationships. Wisdom comes from hard work. Wisdom comes from your everyday existence. So somebody young can have wisdom if they're paying enough attention to what's going on around them. If they listen enough to people around them, you can gain, they can gain wisdom. Many of us who are older need to listen to people around us to gain more wisdom. And we can also gain wisdom through our prayer, right? We pray not necessarily to speak to God, but to hear God in our lives. As God, as we rattle through things when you're praying, this is why Jesus said, we do not, I do not really admire those people who just rattle on repetitive prayers. Prayer is a personal encounter. Prayer is a very intimate conversation, but one in which you allow for the other to speak to you, even if that speaking is silence. Because in that silence, you hear God. In that silence, you can think more clearly. In that silence, you can organize your thoughts and actually create a response or a strategy or whatever it is that's weighing heavily upon you at that moment. How am I going to deal with my husband who just got diagnosed with cancer? How am I going to deal with my child who you know, just lost their job and is going through marital issues? How can I help these people? What am I supposed to do, Lord? And the prayer is just that. Lord, help me to be the best person I can be, the best husband, the best father, the best wife, the best sister, to help my brother, my father, my husband, my wife. And then listen, hear God's call. God calls you to be there. I was just on the phone with someone on my way here. Her mother is dying. She has two brothers. She said eight years ago, one of her brothers who was caring for her mother, who was not at that point near death, in her words, dumped her mother on her and moved to South Carolina. And she said, I have a little resentment toward my brother. And I said, you know what? Your brother gave you a gift. And she said, what are you talking about? Father, it was really hard. I said, I know. But you were being called at that precise moment to be with your mother for the rest of her life. And she had told me that her relationship with her mother at that point hadn't always been very good. I said, you got the most amazing gift of all. For the last eight years, you have been with your mother every single day. You have helped her, you have listened to her, you have read to her, you have, you have, done, you have walked with her, you've gotten caregivers for her, you've helped them to help her. Your life has been very focused on her. And now, as she approaches the end of her life, you can look at yourself in the mirror and say, I was a good daughter. I feel so close to my mother for what I was able to do for her over these many years. And I'm at peace with her passing. She's 88, I think, 89 years old. This woman can now be at peace with her mother as her mother transitions to be with God. I said, you know, if your mother had gone to South Carolina with your brother, and you were out here, always resenting you know, your mother and never being, never being the opportunity to help her in any way, and she were to die, you would be feeling terrible. And you would carry that terrible feeling, she's, this woman's in her 50s, 
for the next 30 or 40 years. And now, if your mother passes, I mean, it's still a loss, but you can be at peace because you have done everything possible. You heard the call, you responded to the call, you lived the call, and you get that opportunity now to just say, wow, how blessed am I? Oftentimes the call gives us that opportunity to consider whether we are truly blessed or whether there's so much more out there that we wish we had. You know, oh, so-and-so has a new X or Y or Z, I want a new X, Y or Z. It's a very childish response to the world, right? But we all have it. We all have it, whether it's a new iPhone or whether it's a new Ferrari or whether it's a new, you know, multi-million dollar home. We have the opportunity, as we listen to God's voice, God's call, to distance ourselves from that kind of response to the people around us, that they have so much more. And we have the opportunity to be grateful. In my homilies, I call it the attitude of gratitude. We have an attitude of gratitude. I was once with a lady, she was she was not near death, but she wanted to be anointed, and so I was, I was happy to do that for her. And I went into her family room, and it was her and her husband sitting on the couch, and who I learned to be her son sitting on the other couch, a love seat. And in this room, there were hundreds of pictures. Pictures, 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 pictures. But I didn't say anything about the pictures at that moment. She started to tell me about all her maladies. You know, I have this wrong, and I have this wrong, and I have this wrong, and I don't know why God is doing this to me, and you know, this is just so terrible. And she was really, she was on a, a long complaint. And I let her complain. And then I looked at her and I said, you know, I don't really see it that way. She said, what do you mean, Father, you don't see it that way? How could you not see it that way? And I said, well, I'm looking around this room and I see all these pictures. I said, I imagine, is this your family? Oh yeah, that's when we went to so-and-so and that's when we went there and that was so-and-so's wedding and that was the graduation and that was this. I mean, all of these pictures. And I said, well, if I were you, I would think about how blessed I am as opposed to, you know, how cranky I am right now that things aren't exactly perfect. And she looked at me and I said, well, but Father, I mean, I have a lot of things wrong with me. And I said, yes, you do. But you also have a lot, a lot of blessings. Even if we just consider what's captured in these pictures, which is a tiny fraction of how blessed you are. By the way, as I look out the back window, I see a beautiful pool and a beautiful yard, right? Because this is Southern California. I said, this is just a tiny fraction of how blessed you are. I said, who's this sitting next to you? Well, that's my husband. How long have you been married? 62 years. There's another one. There's another blessing. And then I looked at him and I looked back at her and I said, I'm sure every day with him wasn't a blessing, but nonetheless, 62 years, that's pretty good. The point is, God just sometimes calls us to just snap out of it, right? So I got called to do this, right? That's what you all wanted to hear about. It's boring, but I will tell it to you. But let me just say, this talk is not about, although I wouldn't mind a few new recruits to the priesthood, but then you'll never talk to your mother again. So, unless you come, come on up here. We, we can talk after this. Yeah, all right, there we go. The point is, every call from God is not a dramatic, incredible, life-changing, you know, I was going that way, and then God smacked me over the head with a baseball bat, and now I'm going that way. That is not right until I graduated from the seminary and came down here. But you know, God didn't just call me when I was 53 years old and my wife had passed away. God calls each one of us at stages in our lives. So I'm blessed that there's some young people out there. Thank you for being here. I hope uh, nobody had to drag you here, but if they did, thank you to whoever dragged you here. I know, I know, I know. Sorry. Uh, I'll make it as interesting as possible. So the point is, every day you hear God's voice in your head. It's not your mother. 
it's God's voice. There's God's. There's your mother's voice. That's another. Yeah, you can distinguish the two. God's is the small, still voice. Your mother's is louder than that, usually. Yeah. The point is, we know in our hearts, we know in our heads, God's voice. From the time we're little, we make choices. Those choices can either follow what we know to be God's will, or they can be contrary to that. When our son was, I don't know, not so much in elementary school, maybe probably seventh and eighth grade, every day when he left, my wife or I would say to him, sometimes both of us, make good choices today. Make good choices. That does a couple of things. One, it puts responsibility on each one of you, young people, to, to be accountable for what you decide to do. But it also opens your heart to the possibility of choices. And when you open your heart, you allow God into it to help you make those choices. It's all well and good to have a wide range of choices, but if you have no process pursuant to which you actually can decide among various options, then you are floundering. You're rolling the dice. You're no more likely to make a good choice than a poor choice among the many choices available to you. But if you have any sense of faith, if you have any sense of relationship with our Heavenly Father, and you take a moment and you listen, you may not hear His voice, but something in your head will tell you that's a stupid choice, that's a stupid choice, that's a really stupid choice, that is the choice you should make. And you will realize you avoided going out with the kids who got in trouble or arrested, or going to do something stupid with the kids who were drinking underage, or are going to do something ridiculous with the kids who wanted to vandalize something. And just in your head, because you used a process of discernment, a process of decision making, influenced by God who creates what we call a conscience right in us why do we do what we do why do we do the right thing instead of the wrong thing when we do the wrong thing why do we feel badly about it because we have in us built in is a conscience a conscience which allows us to understand and to appreciate God's place in our lives that is God's voice in the simplest terms. And it is not as dramatic as being knocked to the ground and blinded by a light. It is not as dramatic as God speaking to us through that bush. Although if that bush were burning right now, it would be something. But that doesn't happen very often. It happened once in recorded, in recorded biblical history that a bush was burning and not consumed and Moses approached it. We do hear throughout the Bible, as was quoted by our aspiring deacon here, um, that God calls and we don't recognize his voice. So when he called to Samuel, Samuel thought it was Elijah. He said, no, I didn't call you, go back to sleep. But it was God, right? And what was the appropriate answer? The appropriate answer that we all know very clearly is, here I am. Here I am. Somebody calls any one of you at any time in the night, you say, here I am. Because you're making yourself available to whatever that call is, if you say, here I am. If you say, get, get away from me, you're bothering me, or get out of here, or I don't want to be bothered right now, or you know, knock it off, stop bothering me while I'm sleeping. That would be the opposite of an open heart and an open mind and an open opportunity to hear the call. Now, one of the things that we also read in scripture is, if today you hear God's voice, what are we supposed to do? Harden not your hearts. Don't harden your heart. Leave your heart open. Now, we get a lot of warnings like this, right? We're told in so many passages of Scripture to listen for God's small, still voice. 
God wasn't in the wind. He wasn't in the fire. He wasn't in the earthquake. He was in the small, still voice. We're continually warned that God is calling to us. And yet, we allow ourselves to be distracted and to be separated from God's call. We make our own noise to drown out God's call. And noise doesn't have to even always be physical noise. It doesn't have to be loud shouting or loud music. Distractions prevent us from hearing. Ask anybody who's sitting in a chair when their wife calls from the other room and said, any husband who's sitting in a chair, not even watching TV necessarily, maybe not even reading the paper, just a piece of undigested beef or something, I can't remember, in, in uh, Christmas Carol. So anyway, um, I loved the spiritual exercise of St. Ignatius. I recommend it to all of you. Their program up there, uh, a lot of really sincere uh, Ignatian spirituality, people would call it like exercises light, but you know what? They get the job done and you get a really good experience. So not plugging for those guys, I'm just saying, spiritual exercise is good no matter where or how you do it. But back to this. Um, I enjoyed the experience so much I went back again. And the second time that I went through this, I felt that same voice, that same call, pretty much those same words. So I went up to Father Ed Broom, who is the uh, facilitator, and I said, Father, do you have a second? And he said, yeah. And I said, you remember I introduced myself to you last time? He said, oh yeah, you're Mike. He said, your wife passed away. I said, that's right, that's right. I said, well, you know, last time, and this time, I've got this calling that said that I should become a priest. And he said, oh, really? You should pursue that. And I said, but Father, I'm 53 years old. And he said, God knows how old you are. <laughs> Apparently, he wants you anyway. <laughs> so I left there and went uh, home and the next day I called the vocation office and the vocation director at that time, not Father Brandon, but Father John Moneypenny, and uh, I talked to his secretary and he, she said, well, he's having an event um, at, uh, they did these little discernment events, different evenings, and so you can come up to it. It was at Marywood uh, back when the diocese was there. And so I did. And I met him, and I explained to him who I was, and what was going on, and what I was thinking. And he said, well, you know, we can talk about this. You know, I'm not sure if you have a calling or not, but we can certainly help you to discern whether you are or not being called by God. And so that's what happened. Uh, we started to work together, but I had this really, so talk about God's call, right? I had a notion now, if I was going to do this, I was going to do it in Detroit. Detroit, Michigan. Why? Well, I had gone to the University of Michigan for law school. I met my wife at the University of Michigan. Her family lived in Dearborn, and we had a summer home in, or just north of Detroit on a, on a river up there. So, and by the way, they're desperate for priests in Detroit. Now, those of you who live out here couldn't imagine anybody ever in their right mind wanting to go and live in Detroit, but I did. So, um, I started discerning with Father John. I told him from the very beginning, I'm going to do this in Detroit. No problem. I'll help you at least discern whether you have a calling or not. And then you can do what you need to do. So I eventually contacted the vocation director in Detroit, Archdiocese of Detroit. And he said, well, uh, after we exchanged some information, well, I should probably meet you. I said, that's great. I said, I will, you know, do you want me to come out there? And he said, yeah. So I flew out there, met with him. He knew all about me before I met with him. And at the end of the meeting, he said, well, that was a good meeting. It was like an hour. Like, I came, you know, 2,000 miles for this, so maybe we could do something else, you know. But anyway, it was about an hour. And then he said, I just want to let you know, Archbishop Vigneron has never, he emphasized the word never, approved a candidate for the priesthood that has a child. And I said, but Father, you know, you knew I had a son. Well, yeah, I was just thinking if I met you, you know, I might want to ask him to reconsider that uh, policy, but I, you know, I didn't want to do that until I met you. Oh. 
I said, now that I've met you, I, I think I'll ask him, uh, you know, about this, but it'll probably take, you know, 30 to 45 days to get this all sorted. The way this works in my experience, there was one Paul, and there was one Moses, and there were a few others scattered about, but for the most part, that's not the way it happens. But God, and God will never grab us and twist our arm behind our back and force us to do anything. God will never grab us by the little hair on the back of the head like Sister Benignus used to do to me, which really hurt. She was very good at it. In the 1960s and 70s, we wore our hair a little longer so she could get a good hold of it. She could take me anywhere she wanted to go. God is not as aggressive as Sister Benignus. He will not push himself on us. He will always be there for us. He will always be there to help us. He will always be there to call to us. We have to listen for the call. We have to be open to the call. And we have to respond to the call. It does him no good to tell us exactly what to do. This is like, you know, what you have when you have a teenager. Tell them exactly what to do. You know, you better start on that paper. If you don't start on that paper, you're going you're gonna to run out of time. Dad, I got this. All right, I know, but you know, when's the paper due? Next Monday. But Dad, it's only Tuesday. It's not due until next month. Start now. Dad, I got this. I got this. And then, you know, at about 11 o'clock Sunday night, when he's still up, is what are you still doing up? Well, I got to work on that paper. <laughs> Dude, I told you on Tuesday. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday, and today, earlier today, and now it's 11 o'clock and you're working on the paper. Now luckily he was a pretty good student, so that didn't happen very often. But you know, like God, I could not drag him and force him to sit down at the at his laptop or whatever to get going on his paper. He had to do that himself. We have to respond to the call ourselves. We have to be open, and we have to consider it, and then we have to respond to it. Because it does no good to have all the best directions in the world and then not follow them. It's like when I put something together from Ikea. Do you ever put anything together from Ikea? Sometimes I think, oh yeah, I got this, and I'll go and put something together, which is really hard to do, and then I'll flip the page like, oh, yeah, I was supposed to do this before I did that, now that drawer is not going to go the way it's supposed to go. It's like, well, maybe my wife won't notice. You know, it's possible. <laughs> the point is, you can have all the best instructions in the world. If you don't listen to them or follow them, it's not going to work. All right, so what happened to me? Let's see, where are we here? Five, ten minutes. I only have five or ten minutes? You can what, are you kidding? As you want, but yeah. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Call me all the way up here from Huntington Beach, I have, or down here from Huntington Beach? Five or ten minutes. All right, I'll give you a quick five on, on who I am and why I do what I do. Um, so, as I told you, my wife died unexpectedly in 2012, February of 2012. I was sitting right up the hill in my apartment. And um, she was in our house in Lake Oswego. I could not reach her uh, the day before. Uh, like that evening anyway, and then so I called all day long the next day, and I couldn't reach her, and finally I asked a friend to go over to the house, and she found her there. That changed my retirement plan dramatically. I was supposed to work for this company called Alex for about uh, two or three years. We were gonna sell the company. I was gonna retire. I was going to study possibly for the diaconate. I was going to teach. I had been an adjunct faculty member at uh, the college level, the business school level, and law school, and I thought I'll teach at some level, and I, I just wanted to teach. And then we'll travel, my wife and I, and then when my son got out of college,